Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm Thomas Amann, uh, part of the Institute of Architectural Design, and also uh, together with Tina Gregorich, a project coordinator for the Lina contribution of Theovin. Uh, thanks for joining everyone uh, for the presentation of the Lina architecture program and the guest lectures of our dear fellows Charlie Bledel and Estelle Julien. Um, I think most of you, the majority, has heard, uh, has heard a story before, but here is the kind of official full disclosure. The Institute of Architectural Design is a member of the European architecture platform LENA, which means uh, learning, interacting and networking in architecture. It's a network connecting cultural and educational institutions with emerging practitioners and thinkers in architecture. The ambition or aim is to join forces to steer the architectural sector towards a more sustainable, circular and clean practices. And at the same time to highlight new and emerging voices in the scene. It's also thoughts on CO2 emissions and clean um, practices that led us to do this whole thing in hybrid format. Um, having the speakers and the panel on Zoom. But I hope, nevertheless, we will compensate the lack of physical presence with, uh, with an interaction with you and uh, uh, interesting content. Uh, about LENA, who uh, we are, LENA consists of about 25 um, so-called members. It's architectural museums, universities, research networks, foundations, etc., etc., and uh, so many high-profile cultural and educational institutions. Most of them were already part of the predecessor, the Future Architecture Platform, some of you might know. Uh, so, yeah, we are very proud to be part of this uh, since uh, last June, when we started our activity. Um, so, one could also say LENA is a com community of enthusiasts, uh, critical but optimistic thinkers, makers and enablers. Each year, LENA offers the chance for so-called LENA Fellows, we will hear some of them tonight, uh, to be become part of their uh, program and feature their work through lectures, workshops or other collaborative formats, which we're doing right now. Um, for the first year, we as the Institute uh, invited two fellows to join us at TUVIN to bring in new knowledge and approaches, but above all, to question and to challenge us, to help us to think outside of our bubble and kind of overcome our preconceived concepts and methods of learning, teaching, interacting, but also of doing things. Concretely speaking, we invited two spatial practitioners uh, to lead a design studio with a focus on a hands-on workshop at the campus of Vienna Boys Choir in Sekien. Some of the students of the group are already uh, part of the audience. Uh, a context in which we, as an institute or department, have been regularly involved uh, during the last years with workshop, design studios, and so on. In this semester, in this course, we will explore uh, experimental um, design practicing practices using locally specific materials and waste found on site. This is actually an image of our first research trip in November with Charlie and Estelle, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so waste uh, and local materials found on site, but then also in the region of Wörthersee or Alpe Adria. In order to create a kind of material library of potential local recipes. So at the same time, connecting different material resources, but also on a social level, different local players or actors. So to say a new material or social narrative to the region exemplified on the side of uh, Zekirn. The course will be a kind of special task force embedded in a series of design studios at our institute uh, this semester with many people involved. Jakob is in the back of the space as a kind of mastermind of the whole operation within our institute, at least. Um, yeah, so, but our course is a, for us, it's a very new kind of agenda to be involved not only in the design of things, but much earlier in the process, in the basic research and development of potential materials and their application, so kind of a new territory for us as architects uh, at TU Vienna, I would say. So lots of things to learn, lots of things we don't know yet. Um, 
are two fellows. There's kind of a double information now. On the right, they are in life. In the middle, they are uh, with their portrait. It's uh, uh, Charlie Bleudel from Germany, now based in Rotterdam, and Estelle Julien from France, now uh, based in Valencia. Charlie is a communication and social designer working in the field of exhibition designer production and in her self-initiated projects and workshops mostly tackling and working with material waste streams. So we will hear she's into rubble a lot. Um, Estelle is a trained architect. I would say she's more a critical, spatial, uh, cultural practitioner working on projects um, that bring together material and resources, the urban and the rural, but most importantly also people in a collaborative community building process. So they are not only experts on the topic that we're dealing with this semester, we need them for this, but uh, they are most important also experts on what it means to establish a somehow alternative for critical practice. So it's both a new topic and approach they're bringing in, but I think also um, yeah, kind of new perspective on the role of architects, designers, or spatial practitioners in certain contexts, um, processes, or problems. So what kind of competent senses or expertise do we have, and where do we need to collaborate collectively, interdisciplinary to somehow contribute meaningfully to the problems of today? Um, Lina and TU Vienna have also a kind of, uh, yeah, let's say, import-export uh, relationship in the sense that two colleagues of ours, Bernadette Kreis and Max Utek, uh, are also Lina fellows. Um, you might know them from different courses because they're also part of the uh, Institute of uh, Housing, Department of Housing and Design at this university. And as Lina fellows, they are kind of a pair, of course they're individuals, but this time in a pair. They are participating uh, this year in various programs of different institutions with their project Palace of Unlearning. So it's actually unlearning, interacting and networking in architecture for them. So we will hear about that also later during their uh, talk. The plan for uh, the next hour and a half is to hear two short lectures by Jali and Estelle, followed by a response by uh, Bernadette and Max that uh, will lead into an open discussion on the panel, but also, of course, hopefully with you all. Um, before handing over to Tina and further to Rotterdam and Valencia for the presentations and discussions, I'd like to announce already the next uh, events in the course of our LINA program. It's a visit to uh, Atelier Luma in Aal. It's not a public uh, 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 excursion, so you're invited to follow us on Instagram, but not in live, unfortunately. Atelier Luma is also a partner or a member of Alina, so we're kind of visiting um, partners. There will be another lecture by Rotor from Belgium in May, and then of course the workshop itself with a public final event on May 31st in uh, Sekien. So stay tuned and uh, enjoy the evening. So now I'll hand over to uh, the panel. Uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a big pleasure to, to welcome four LINA fellows uh, to the audience um, of the TU Wien. Um, some time ago, when I was invited um, as a representative of uh, TU Wien to join LINA from Mateusz Czelik, who is the, let's say, the president of this um, specific organization, I was really um, honored um, and also glad because it, it gave an opportunity for the TUV community to be linked with uh, other extremely important uh, educational, but most, um, most of all non-educational institutions across Europe. And that was a fundamental shift because the one of the, as um, Thomas brilliantly presented the ambition of Lina, was actually to exchange this kind of gap between academia and practice and to give basically young emerging artists, architects, uh, professionals um, a different network, but also different platform to, to exchange their knowledge and to contribute. contribute. And also to show the, the future emerging practitioners 
um, what that they are manifold of um, futures in which we could operate as architects. There is not only one way. There are, you know, there is not. Uh, there are like manifold of ways which we will see and and hear today. What is so important today with opening up very specific um, topics, which is dealing with uh, actually. Um, addressing the climate crisis, which is one of the key aspects, it's that we needed a more interdisciplinary approach. We needed um, expertise from outside of our uh, academia in order to tackle the depth of this kind of uh, material library or the waste streams and the potentials which this brings to the future of our architectural thinking. So yeah, it's a it's a big pleasure for me to have uh, four uh, Lina fellows. So uh, Charlie, as a non-architect, um, dealing with very architectural issues, but of course understanding also wider perspective as a curator in a very important um, European institution, but also seeing it from with with you as a practitioner to really address uh, has been addressing and and a lot of experience in, in this kind of waste. Um, waste agendas and potentials. And of course, um, Estelle, uh, being an architect and then turning into a very critical um, voice um, and, and trying to find another basically path for one of the possible paths for our, um, us uh, architects in the current uh, conditions. And of course, it's great to have two fellows from our community, uh, the teachers, who are dealing, who are involved in their own project, but were able to to join us um, to to give uh, to give us uh, very important feedback. So uh, thank you, Max and Bernadette, for joining us. Um, um, the platform Lina, it's meant to grow. It's also meant to inspire young architects and young um, students to apply, maybe for the next edition of Lina. Um, and we would really, um, we are very looking forward to. To, to, to hear your uh, feedback and contribution to what we are trying to, to do with this kind of um, connection that we uh, established. Yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you mostly Thomas for organizing this hybrid event. Um, yeah, uh, my word is to um, Charlie and Estelle or however Thomas uh, was planning that this goes further. Thank you everyone for joining. It's working, right? So I have some help here. So, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start briefly in introducing myself and my background. I'm Estelle, and uh, uh, I'm a French arch architect um, based in Valencia. I have a degree uh, uh, from the School of Architecture of Marseille. And uh, I start my relationship with Spain with the uh, Erasmus program and after that, the Leonardo program. After 10 years working in international studios um, in Valencia, Paris, eh, Paris, Marseille and Berlin, I worked a few years uh, as an independent architect in community project and uh, artistic project. And now I work uh, in a cultural management company where I coordinate the uh, citizen participation area and where I are uh, also um, investigating uh, innovative project in education. Um, when I speak about uh, citizen participation, I mean that we promote a processes to give voice to people, adults and children, to influence the transformation of their own built environment. So for this lecture, um, I've been thinking about how to classify uh, the projects that I develop and in a more specific way. Generally, um, I classify them in wide way, fields uh, as architecture, art, participation, and ecology. Um, but I think it's more descriptive to, to talk about research, spe special interventions, culture and heritage, community project, material and uh, territory and education. 
Um, with this presentation, we are going to we are going through some of those projects to illustrate them uh, in a more concrete way. I will present them literally following the three concepts of the lecture, learning, interacting, networking. I'm just going to change the order. For each concept, I'm going to, to briefly present a set of projects, and then I'm going to develop one of, or two as a case of study. Uh, so inter uh, let's start with interacting. Something like 10 years ago in Spain, um, many group of young architects um, began to create collective to resell the public space and demand the participation um, of the people in the in the urban decisions. This in initiative caught my attention. And from this moment, I began to focus my practice from another point of view, uh, where people became protagonists uh, in a very direct way. For example, in this image, we see one of the action that we organize in an abandoned pool in a neighborhood in the suburb of Madrid in the frame of the program Imagine Madrid. And um, this other, we can see a um, um, project about the identity changes and memory of an old convent from its foundation until now. During the process, exhibition, guided tour, urban routes, workshop, meeting, and concerts have opened the opened the possibility of knowing the memory of the convent through different areas of knowledge. Then bottom, bottom left, an action that we carry out with the collaboration of the resident of the neighborhood to make visible an abandoned and inaccessible lot for more than uh, 15 years. In all of this case, the idea of activism and interaction with the people are fundamental. Um, this one is also a project. Uh, is also a project that aims to rescue part of the local memory, linking to the industrial activity of a little town close to Valencia. The project deals with the uh, imaginaries of the people linking to the industrial activity, both from the productive areas and from the daily life of the inhabitants. From many interview, historical research, collection of, collection of archival material, identification and registration of emblematic buildings and live histori stories related to them, we generated we generate an exhibition and guided tour through the town. In short, a meeting point between generations to reflect on the identity of the town. So in all these uh, projects, um, uh, a kind of interaction project, we can find those uh, common points, memory and heritage, social and cultural perspective, reappropriation of space for those who habit them, um, creation or recreation or temporary or lasting community, generation of common narrative and imaginaries and disruption as a kind of intrusion into everyday life, as we can see in the, in the photo. Um, for me, it's hard to, to do the difference uh, with uh, interacting and networking. Um, because networking, interacting is uh, also acting together, sharing knowledge uh, around the common interests and around the desire to do. So to different them, I'm going to take the word net uh, as reference in the sense of in the sense of greed and extending it to the idea of territory that uh, that is defining the territory as a framework as the network. Um, that's why I show those few words. The lights you see represent an underground water uh, ditch present since Islamic times uh, that intensifies according to the flow of water. We don't know, we cannot see this, this ditch, but the light uh, remember, remember it. 
The thread around the column represents the, leg, the length of a section of the Camino of Compostela and the inclined incline plane, plane from a degree of 23.5 degrees, the same angle of the inclination of the earth with respect to the plane of the translation around the, uh, around the sun. So with this idea, um, to speak about the territory uh, with a sensitive and poetic approach, I am going to present the two projects that more, are more related to the workshop, uh, Matter Library. The first um, is May you rise never burn, that I developed in all at Atelier Luma, um, with a Balik, a Balik Hippopoi Collective. I don't know if... Um, Jacob is in the photo, no, I don't know, Jacob was, was there also. Um, the project proposed the, collect the collective fabrication of a dune protection device, geotextiles, made from braided rice straw, a way to contribute to the search for solution developed from ecological material for the protection of the coastline, um, for the protection of the coastline, um, while suggesting alternative uh, to the polluting effect of burning a rice straw. Uh, the project aimed to share knowledge and interaction with the local population, craftsmen and craftswomen, rice farmers and other actors or users of the territory. In this sense, participative with uh, living workshop and collective installation uh, were organized. For example, in the photo top left, we can see in the same photo, in the same time, geomorphologists, eco guards, people from the nudist association, designer, and neighbor in neighborhood working all together during the collective uh, installation in the dunes. Um, the other project, um, more linked to um, matter library, is Sedimento a project that I have developed just after May You Rise Never Burn, which drew my attention to the movement of the sediment. So sediment a fo uh, focus of uh, focus on the importance of the movement of sediments in our global ecosystem. Here we can see the Mediterranean Sea on the on the left and the glacier the glacier of the Rhone on the on the right. Um, so how to treat and portray this particle transported by water to approach uh, and question the reality of our world from sens sensory um, exper experiences. How to think about gravity and currents that relate apparently unrelated territory, but that have a common history. I underst understood uh, journey that took me up to the Rhone River from the, its delta in the Camargue. I was just uh, ending the workshop uh, in May, Rice and Um and, uh, and I go to in its place of, of birth, the Rhone Glacier, located in the Swiss Alps. Along the journey, I took small sample of fine sediments of different types, with which I made um, small performance and object, I recreate um, I recreate a fictitious stratigraphy through this orthodox collection and I have picked up sediment. I hit them at high temperature. I move by hand sediment in eight meter, eight kilometer, 800 kilometer that we have seen in the other picture. You can see here a bit of sediment of the glacier. In next to the as a gift to the Mediterranean, I made both with clay from uh, the bottom of the lake uh, of Gen uh, Lake Geneva, and then I brought them back to the Rhone on their way to the Medi Mediterranean Sea. In a certain way, uh, the scientific um, method was an inspiration to be diverted and to introduce fictional elements. So it's like a, a way to, to have a polysemic approach of the territory. And for the process, um, 
the process has, has been built thanks to the collaboration of different agents, such as speciali specialists from the Worm Sediment Observatory and the Forel Institute, a ceramist, a curator, but also the Geneva um, Brigade and the Center of Underwater Sport in Geneva. You can see, we can see the photo here. So in, in May you rise, never burn. Um, and in Sedimento, the idea of, um, of, of network can be understood as the setting up of agents around the project, but also uh, as a creation of links with a uh, territory. So here again, I do a little list of the principles concepts linked uh, in my point of view with the idea of networking. So generate link with agents and territory, exposing the body, the body as part of the process, explore material with exi existing uh, know-how, knowledge, sensitive and poetic approach, uh, pragmatism and experimentalism, creativity and systematism, and sharing knowledge. Um, uh, talking about um, uh, knowledge, let's talk about now um, uh, learning. Here is an image of a workshop um, uh, called to, uh, to live between lines, to activate the library of the College of Architects in, of Valencia. Um, after that, you can see the workshop on wheels where ch children have designed and built their own circuit for scooters. And the project without, without cracks would not have ceased, where we have uh, explored the movement of the ground. Um, and this one, uh, dance, uh, Dancer and Salter, which is in process right now. Uh, it is, let's say, the continuation of the sedimental project, the project we just, uh, we just saw. But in this case, the research is carried out together with the student, uh, the teacher, inviting specialists such as uh, botanists, ceramists, oceanographers and agronomists to guide us in the process. So the pro basically the, the, pro the project dancer is also proposed to reflect on the salt, it's also a sediment, by moving from hydrology to ceramics. And um, it wants to question what is its nature, its role and how it influence and will influence our environment. We are also trying to wonder about the movement associated with uh, it, such as gravity, capillarity, and evaporation. And a um, very important um, element also are the halophyte plants, plants adapt uh, to salty environment um, for their particular composition are also included in the perspective. The idea is therefore to revisit knowledge from field as uh, diverse as oceanography, botany, sal saline exploitation and ceramics by contextualizing them with a global issue and uh, concrete territory. Um, <clears throat> so in all these processes, the main objective when we we work with chai with children is to activate uh, curiosity to generate new link with the lived space and with the territory to use also art artistic practice as a knowledge to tool and to propose learning experiences around specific projects um so <clears throat> with those projects, I think you can see a multiplicity of ways <clears throat> to approach the practice of architecture and the question that always crosses uh, them about the role of the, the, the role of the architect um, about networking, interacting and learning. Then to conclude, I think I, I, I it's very a very speed. <laughs> a quick presentation. But to conclude, I uh, just want to show this little text uh, that you probably know too well, taken from Design for a Real World. 
but it's as an Austrian <laughs> designer, I think it's for me. Um, so uh, this text uh, from Victor Papanek uh, is very important to me and I inspire me uh, a lot. So um, it's very great <laughs> So thank you very much, and um, to to for your attention, if for enjoying my English. <laughs> Thank you so much, Estelle. It was brilliant. Um, thanks for the presentation. It was also great to end up with Papanek, which is a designer that all the architects should know about. At least read one book uh, by him. So that's good transition to, to Charlie as a designer. <laughs> and uh, Victor probably played some role in your education or, or not really. <laughs> Let, let's hear that. Definitely. <laughs> Yes, I think we can't do reading in a reading list without. <laughs> um, yeah, should I dive right in and then we go into the discussion? Or, yeah, Thomas can't say anything now. He's in the audience. Yeah, we, we don't hear you, Thomas, but yeah, <laughs> just go, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. You see my screen? Okay. So all good with the sharing? Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Charlie Bludo. Um, I am a researcher and inter interdisciplinary designer uh, based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. I work there. Um, both as in, in the program team at Het Noe Institute, the Museum for Architecture, Design and E-Culture here in Rotterdam. Um, but I also teach at the Willem de Koning Academy and Rotterdamse Academie voor Baukunst um, here in Rotterdam. And I also have my, um, my own practice here, which is largely based on my big fascination for material and waste streams and my small um, obsession with construction waste and rubble, which Thomas already mentioned. Um, yeah, this is me in my rubble paradise at one of the many recycling facilities around Rotterdam throughout the Netherlands. You know them probably as well. They are very close to any urban environment and filled with a sea of uh, crushed construction waste. More about this in a bit. I am also a villager. I come from a village of 500 people, um, mainly winemakers in the Rhineland in Germany. Um, and I'm realizing more and more how far away you go from your roots, but how they slowly come back into your practice no matter what. And um, someone who influenced my practice a lot is my grandfather, who you see here um, doing what we will do in our workshops, uh, in our workshop and what I tend to do a lot wherever I go. It's largely connected to a zipper bag and a shovel. <laughs> and what you see him doing here is collecting samples of um, soil containing clay from the fields uh, in our village. And um, this is something that I really connect to him, um, knowing very well as a builder master, how much clay is contained in the vineyards surrounding our village and taking me on walks to the local stone quarries um, where you could find this uh, gray stone that we have um, around, yeah. Uh, our village and in the region and um, when you would take me to these quarries they were really not so visible and understandable to me because they were um, in his time flourishing but in my time exhausted and used up and filled with a very different kind of a material and that is also the kind of context or question um, that I'm trying to grapple with 
uh, the quarries that were flourishing in his generation um, are filled now with construction waste and sealed up. Um, and this is also the basis to, to my research, um, this question of how do I quarry the landscape of my generation, how do I quarry a man-made landscape that doesn't consist of that natural ecological material anymore, but is constituted um, in a man-made kind of material. And this practice is also very connected to its time in a context when in 2020, the global human-made mass exceeded all living biomass in the planet. And we realize landscapes can be romanticized, but they do not, um, do not consist only anymore of the ecological and the natural, but, but they are very much interwoven with a human manipulation and a human interference. And we live also in a context where 39% of the carbon footprint comes from the construction and demolition industries and our landscapes transform from ecological to man-made material geologies. And this is also a context which um, I love how Keller Easterling describes it, a context in which large swaths of building and landscape seem to simultaneously cultivate, be cultivated and harvested or built and unbuilt. It is a context in which construction waste is abundant. It's one of our largest waste streams. And I love to look at it as a material stream, not so much with the connotation of waste, but as a material that for now we are using to fill up holes, we use it to level up um, a, a plane before we build a road, but we do not bring it back in the urban environment. We do not bring it back into the built context. We do not want to surround ourselves with it. So my question is, how, how can we harvest, as Keller describes, how can we harvest this unbuilt environment? And how can we also not so much hide it underneath the ground, but bring it above and study its behavior, study its qualities, also understand its aesthetical value. And I try to look at it or, well, at the moment, I'm not so much trying anymore. At the moment, I, it just seems to me like this. I look at it just the way that Charles Darwin looks at, at worms and their behavior and how they um, develop these constructs above the soil that they do by digesting and eating up soil and uh, processing it into these clouds of structures above the ground. Um, which brings me to the project that I did in my master studies. That's when I started my research um, into construction waste. It's called soft rubble. Um, I did that at the Design Academy in Eindhoven in the social design department. And um, this project that I did is a research into exactly this. How do I um, quarry a man-made landscape and how can I bring it back into an environment that surrounds us and confronts us, but also lets us perhaps fall a little bit in love with that kind of material. And um, I did that for myself by developing a construction system, a construction system that is made out of textile um, and is and contains um, three meter tall textile bags that each have a different sewing pattern and can be filled with crushed construction waste. And as you place them next to each other, fill them and mold the material from the inside and the textile on the outside upwards, you create um, something like this iteration here. It is the first iteration of soft rubble, a wall segment, a prototype of um, a two meter wide wall with a seating element and a window element included. And um, yeah, maybe I go forward here. This 
has been hugely inspired by both the practices of Annie Albers, who completely recognized the potential of textile not only as an interior and element or an element in fashion, something that dresses, but a material that has strong architectural potential and that uh, allows walls to become, as she explains it, pliable planes, very much inspired by yurts and by tents from um, Mongolian uh, communities. And also the first wall being actually a textile wall, um, as also I think Semper names it. Um, another practice that is that has been very influential was Ursula Le Guin, good friend of Donna Haraway, who wrote the carrier bag theory of fiction and describes the first tool of human beings, maybe not so much being the spear, the sword, the killing tool, but the container, the bag, the leaf that contains and that holds together materials that also preserves them for not the use now, but the use later. And that is also something that very much, um, yeah, inspired the use of a bag, of a container to preserve the porosity of the material, to create a temporary structure that can be today, but that can become something else tomorrow through emptying it from its contents, traveling with it somewhere else and setting it up again with a local material stream. These bags were made in the harbor of Rotterdam um, by a company that you, yeah, you find a lot of them in the harbor here. They make sails for sailing boats, but they also make truck covers, container covers, whatever you need in the shipping industry. And I like to look into these industrial infrastructures and see how you can bend them slightly towards another direction and work with them to create something um, else in this in this case a construction system um, with a material and expertise that they are very familiar with but that is not really so much used in architecture yet and then something that such a construction system cannot do without is um, a collective building act and uh, group of willing people to yeah confront their bodies with an overpowering amount and weight of a material and to work together and experience this material stream in its yeah more than human size so what we did here is a building workshop a workshop that is very essential to to my um practice the experience of others rather than telling them about it so i'd rather be on a construction site with you guys now but let me tell you more about what we did on that day so we were with five people 12 tons of material and we had eight hours to construct these um this wall segment important to do is to really engage your whole body and to lean it against the material as you mold it down while someone else is uh, filling it from the top. And there you really recognize how this material almost acts like a very thick liquid and you mold it similar to a vessel on a pottery wheel. You mold it through this external coat um, upwards and you you mold it into shape and it becomes a kind of a women cave around you and you use you you develop your tools along the way especially in this first iteration we had to find our formworks for the window element and so on and so forth and then it becomes this very blobby structure that um, it kind of poses the question of which aesthetics are we willing to live with and what will we find beautiful in the future? Because I think that is very much a part of this desirable future that we would like to create. Can we find this beautiful? Another iteration of Soft Rubble is a furniture series that I developed um, Last year, it's called Klutz, 
And um, it is a traveling urban furniture that is lightweight in its unfilled um, state. But when you bring it to a site and you find your local material stream and fill it with it, um, it becomes a very local and a very heavy uh, urban furniture. It was shown for the first time at the Architecture Week in Basel last year and became part of the Basel Pavilion, which um, also questioned the aesthetics of reused materials. How do you build with a material library of secondhand materials? How does this also become a different kind of aesthetic rather than the cute DIY reuse that we are so used to? Are we maybe ready for something new and something else? Does it have to look like a second life or can it look like something else? Um, this seating, uh, these seating elements were part of the pavilion uh, for the public program, but also stayed there for the summer for different workshops and people to picnic um, on an old train track that was shortly before uh, the removal. And this whole architecture um, week was also there to inject public programming and cultural um, programming into areas of the city that are not very much uh, attractive uh, attractive to, to public engagement. So people don't really hang out in these industrial areas, but could they? Um, so it was very much about this question. And um, in this case, the, um, the furniture, not in this case, it's actually in general. So the, the furniture series of Klutz it's, um, is a series of modular bags. You have a dot, a line and a curve, which allows you to create different seating uh, settings and spatial settings for diverse conversations. And it again, um, every time asks the question of what is in the bag? What is in the bag in Basel? What is in the bag in the next iteration? Next month, it's going to go to Milan for the Salona. What is the local construction waste mixture there? And each time it tells a different story of ecological matter and industrial material. And it again and again asks bodies to interact with this material stream and become physical with it. Here you see it. Um, yeah, also in uh, the evening. And oh, yeah. Do you hear the sound also? Okay, good. <laughs> this is the, um, the last project that I just want to mention briefly so we can go into the panel. Um, this is what uh, I'm doing with my students normally. Uh, okay, I'm hearing more sound than you, I think. Um, this is a studio I'm teaching at the moment at the Rotterdam's Akademie voor Baukunst, um, where together with a star, uh, the master's students in architecture and Thomas Dierix, an architect from Rotterdam, we are exploring what, um, how to build with construction waste and approach this question of how to quarry a man-made landscape from an architectural point of view. And what we started with is a material inventory and a visit to the Dutch mountains of construction waste uh, here in Rotterdam. And we are mapping these waste streams. Here you see already a diagram that one of our students developed from the natural and ecological environment to um, the industrial and urban environment and the different material streams that interact with it. And at the moment, the students are building their architectural models so that next week they can demolish them and explore if the act of demolition could be an act of design as well and lead us to different new building processes. So that was it for now, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charlie. <clears throat> for this incredible journey of, of the projects um, traveling around and being very heavy um, at the same time. Yeah, quite impressive. Mm. 
I guess Thomas uh, is what it's now um, in the role of the moderator. Yeah. I'm trying to. Can you hear me there as well with the microphone? See me? Um, yeah, so, well, thank you, first of all, for your lectures both. And I will straight hand over to Max and Bernadette, I think, for their response. And then we will see where to go from there. Yeah, also thank you from our side. I think the both lectures were very inspiring and there were so many um, interesting and also important and urgent um, um, things you said and also um, addressing the, the uh, question of aesthetics, we are so used to it, or also um, the question what is in the bag, what we never ask as architects um, when we are designing or building, it's just the design process. So really thank you for that. And um, I mean, um, what I really liked a lot um, is um, how you um, were speaking about material or resources, because normally we don't look at the process, what is before, where coming, where is material, material coming from. And we also don't look so much at what is after the design process or the building is there. So they are really, it's not thinking in a, in a cycle or in a life cycle of a building. We are really excluding some parts of these design processes. I think it's uh, super important that you made this visible in re really concrete projects um, and in investigations, how to deal um, and how to learn to engage or to interact with material or with um, certain processes and really also find ways of learning and exploring that because it's a new field for us um, and also kind of finding a, a visual um, um, voice how to draw or map also these kind of new archives of materials or libraries. I think that's super important when we think about non-extractive forms of architecture. And um, I also liked a lot um, what uh, Estelle brought into the uh, into the into the room the um, idea of a collective practice or a participatory practice because I think we are still very stick to the idea of the lonely male genius white architect who has a solution to a certain pro uh, problem and um and and i think we it, it's absolutely necessary to think um in in times of crisis and then i'm addressing the energy crisis but for, for um overall the the climate crisis but also other crises we are we we are we have to deal with that um we have to think collaboratively or collectively because we have to think um as tina also mentioned in an interdisciplinary or in a non-disciplinary approach and i also liked it a lot that you quoted your grandfather or that you that we bring in to the discourse other voices and other forms of knowledges and um, um i think that's um, super important when we try to find new forms of um, dealing with architecture because i think in the end it's really about the more tangible diverse and participatory um, practice of architecture and um, we're talking a lot about community or engagement but in the end i think um, we're still very stick to this idea that we know how to do it. And I think there are a lot of blind spots. Um, and um, I was really very thankful that you were addressing this, these questions we normally don't address. And maybe that's also the bridge to the project Max and I am doing. Um, I think it's more on a meta level what we try to address. It's it's the, the question of unlearning, which doesn't mean to forget or to cancel something. It's more a bit about... Um, also step outside the institution and, and trying to find new models, how we understand our discipline or our teaching or learning practices or our design practices and building practices. And I'm really very thankful that in your projects or in your talks, there were really concrete examples how we can do that or how we can ask other forms of um, designing or learning about architecture or our environment. And um, so what we address in our project is a lot um, um, very fundamental question. What do we learn in architecture or how how do we learn and who is in power um, to say what we have to learn or how we design? And also the question of aesthetics again. So to which forms of appearance um, do we relate to? And, and also um, who is in power to write the canon of architecture and um, who is invisible and who is um, um, not here in, in this discourse. And, um, and and what we think or what we suggest is, and, and I think we could see that very clear in your projects, is that this um, 
shift we have to make in our heads and but also in our practice is not something which is weird and weak and looks um, strange it is also a kind of a process of power or of joy and and as charlie said um, we have to be get used to other forms in the future or what will we like and i think uh, we should embrace this um, transformation we have to go through and and we we were reading a lot with our students also paul preciado and he also says that this irritation or this transgress or just crossing or transformation is not weakness um, it's power and I think this is also something we should think in our profession about because I think in the end we have to admit that the building industry as you both said or especially also the, uh, the architecture is causing a lot of harm and it's the question how to do less harm and and how we can um, operate in this that field so i'm very thankful for your um, concrete ideas and and projects you you showed to us thank you so much Bernadette, <laughs> for pointing out kind of everything already uh thank you so much uh charlie and estelle and uh, thomas and uh, tina uh and uh, I want to start with Tina because I think it's quite important as well to uh, to talk about Lina as well a bit, um, as well at at uh, TU especially to kind of uh, show as well different perspectives or different futures as you said kind of what what other practices can actually be possible in architecture, and I think it's it becomes more and more important that there are, that there are kind of other practices and other futures in the field of architecture because it's quite obvious that it can't uh, go on like this. So it's, I think uh, Lina is quite a uh, good example how you can promote these different practices that both of you have, uh, and uh, which I think are very uh, astonishing. And uh, I really appreciate a lot what you're doing. Maybe um, talking about the material as well um, to, to connect to Charlie, I think, um, it's super important and super interesting to bring back the material and how to deal with material into um, the architectural education as well. And it's very, um, uh, it kind of is happening now um, that uh, we ourselves and especially the students ask, but isn't, isn't it kind of toxic that we are still using the styrofoam when we are building our models in the model workshops? Isn't it? Isn't it possible to do to do it kind of differently? So um, kind of really hands on now in the architecture education, we're starting to questioning these things as well. Is it really necessary that we produce all these this, uh, toxic ways that we don't really know what to do with afterwards? Um, so I think it's really interesting to really what you said in the in the end, Charlie, to build models and then not forget them in some some way at the uh, university, but to kind of reuse the materials and kind of um, um, have as well this circular thoughts already when you're doing your models in architectural education. So kind of establish already the spirit of reusing circularity in the, um, in, in the school. I think it's super important. Um, and now we are doing this Palace of Unlearning and having we are having a design build project uh, next week as well. And we really want to start to uh, to build to build something with, without having anything because we don't have a budget, obviously. But um, we had today the session and we kind of had this conclusion. No, we have no budget. Actually, we don't have any material. But once you kind of have this... Uh, you have the zero moment and but then it starts already you know the, the students say but there we have this platform which is called Wilhaben in in Austria there's a lot of stuff people are just giving away um you can uh, you can there are a lot of sharing platforms where you can actually rent tools for a day uh so um kind of within 10 minutes we had already a diff totally different project which is probably even more interesting to do for the students and Let's see how it will evolve. Uh, so with questioning all these things, there's this trans transitory moment and kind of this moment, maybe a bit anxious, scary moment, but then things are unlocking. 
And it's super interesting to see what kind of new potentials arise. Um, and then uh, another thing with Charlie, which I obviously liked, is this project of soft rubble, that rubble can be cute as well, which is super amazing thought, because actually the it's a super interesting uh, thought to really think about what will be what will we what are we willing to consider beautiful in the future because it's actually in our hands to decide what is beautiful and what's not so it's maybe this cute rubble instead of this uh, perfect uh, concrete surface swiss uh, concrete for surfaces which are incredibly um, um, hard to produce and you know this cozy cute rubble bag of yours is kind of a totally different uh, way to uh, to create a, a construction material, which I found very astonishing. And then uh, switching to Estelle, um, kind of a, a very soft uh, approach to um, to spatial production. And I really appreciate this idea of bringing back the body into architectural production or spatial production. Uh, because actually now architectural production is very, uh, it's, there's, there's not really a human body involved. It's, it's, it's totally um, mechanical and kind of the, it doesn't have a human scale. So I think this is a very interesting thought and maybe to, to finish with a question to kind of keep the, the discussion going. Uh, I was asking myself, maybe you can elaborate this idea of how you see uh, artistic practice, how you use artistic practice as a knowledge tool, because you were quoting this. Maybe you can elaborate this. You're muted. I think it's because um, it's like a, mm, with almost without boundary, the, the 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 space of the practice of art. So um, when you are researching around a subject, you can use any kind of um, um, you can do any kind of choice. You can make a sculpture, you can pen, you can use a uh, photography, you can, and it's like, for me, like a free, a free space to experiment. And um, in, for example, in the last project, uh, Salter in Dancer, it's like, we have, we have a project around the salt, but we are exploring it with uh, cyanotypia, with cyanotype, with photography, with drawing, with, but in the main while, when we are drawing, we are learning about this plant, we are learning, and it's like a, an experience in, out, in, out all the time. And the, um, the knowledge with a, a corporal a, a body experience is very different. It's very different. Just read a text, or or do something about what is saying this text. I don't know something like that. Also linking to the body to do it directly. What I also recognize is that we used a lot of new words or kind of another vocabulary we don't normally have in architecture. There was the word I don't know small, sensitive. Fabrics, textiles, poetic, soft, soft um, plants, children. I mean, we normal body. I mean, I'm also questioning myself, or maybe this could also be a question to the students and to both of you or to Tina and Thomas also. Do we also need a kind of new vocabulary or are there missing words and in the end also missing spaces um, that we have to explore or that we have to describe and write down or show in drawings or in models or in to learn um, to articulate another approach in architecture or in the practice, how we deal with space, because, you know, um, also in the in the canon of architecture, textiles were always coded as feminine. And, you know, there's this um, text from Adolf Loos, um, Ornament and Crime. So everything which is, I don't know, 
textile or ornament or all these or rubble or all these things are excluded normally when we talk about um, architecture. So I'm I'm asking myself, do we need are there missing words and spaces we have to define and call out and write down and discuss or debate and, and which one could that be? <laughs> More than words, I will say that uh, if we want to care about the environment, we have to love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To love it, we have to, to have a special story with it. So if you work with poetic, if you work with narrative, if you work with history, memory, culture, um, you, you, you can have another kind of relationship with your with your environment so if you love it you want you you want to care of it but if you are totally without linked without nothing just with your screen and you don't really think it's your yeah i think adding to this is um yeah a book i'm reading at the moment is a material kinship reader where this term of material kinship is uh, coined by uh, Chris Dietl and uh, Clementine Edwards and it um, really draws further this theory of kinship that Donna Haraway uh, draws up and how can we stretch this further to something that feels very inanimate to us it's not it's not a bacterium it's not a not a living entity but actually it is and how can we uh, build a connection to this material and how can we indeed love it and uh, what I find very curious and um, I always wonder why these words are not there in architecture why we talk about rigidity and sturdiness and it's um, it's not only a question of what can we find beautiful but also a question of how can we feel safe how permanent and how rigid does an architecture have to be for us to call it a shelter and to call it a home to call it all the things that we feel safe with actually we use a very different vocabulary we almost uh, we rather build a fortress than something to uh, feel at home in so these vocabularies are very very different and um, how can we can we use softer words while and a softer vocabulary while still feeling safe and shielded against whatever might come from the outside and at the same time how can we um, live in a porous environment as Richard Sennett also uh, celebrates how we, can we live in that porous city how can we live in a porous um, environment that lets through and let, that lets in. I think there are so many cultural and social um, connotations in these vocabulary uh, vocabularies, where yeah, you end up with a question of what you are, what are you afraid of? Yeah, absolutely. And you were also talking a lot, both of you, of working collectively or collaboratively. And I would be very much interested how how you you're doing this. How how do you integrate other voices or other perspectives um, in your design process or in your workshop situation? Um, who with whom are you working together, or in in which um, questions are you interested in? Uh, which people are you addressing in your collaborative or collective work? Um, Maybe you can talk about a bit about that as yeah, well. Yeah, and maybe adding for the students as well. How 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 did you build your practice? Actually, I guess both of you are teaching, so maybe you can elaborate this as well to kind of how you build yourself, uh, kind of your position as a professional, as a economically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe I something. think that's a very dead end, isn't it? <laughs> person <laughs> which is quite a struggle but super interesting actually yeah. how you can do it you want to start well for for the first question about um, um collaboration in my case is there is a different kind of relation uh, uh, collaboration like uh, specialists in when i'm working in on a, a specific topic i 
used to 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 work with uh, a specialist, a scientist, or something like that. Um, but I used also to work with um, informal um, groups, uh, as as I said, uh, as I say, uh, as a specialist in experiences. So I'm. Um, I don't know. It's very for me. It's very easy to work uh, with uh, all that kind of uh, people, and all the people is very um, happy to share to 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 think that something they are doing it's interesting or it's interesting in another field or is going to have another kind of uh, reading or so. I always very good experiences with uh, all the um, all the collaboration I have, mm. and it and it's true that I have very 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 few works I did alone. Very, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and regard and um. And regarding how to manage a practice, well, um, in the it's a bit the same, the same, the same way uh, in the art, artistic uh, practice or it's um, presenting project, presenting project all the time <laughs> to foundation, to municipalities, to. Um, art centers. Mm. But you are meaning this in a proactive way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't ask someone to call, to do an open call. You basically approach someone both. with your... In both, actually, both. yeah. Mm -hmm. Both. I think that's quite important for the yeah. students to, to be both. aware of. Yeah, yeah. Because also, you, if you are active in a field or in a topic or so, you all... you you already have some work in your pocket, some works in your pocket. So when you, there is a, 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 a an open call, you, you can, okay, this one is for this open call. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, maybe to start with this uh, question of the collaborative environment and the workshop, um, yeah, I think this is something that actually goes through any of my uh, any of the layers of my work. So uh, I have my practice and my love for rubble, and I also have my work at the New Institute, where I basically create exhibitions together with curators, together with um, editors, together with with authors and writers, together with always a new design team we create only temporary exhibitions and for each collaboration we invite a new spatial designer a new graphic designer and new collaborators who are suitable for this certain topic so to create um, this collaborative environment and to design a collaboration and to be open to the different characters to the different knowledges that are coming in is really rooted in that um, and I learned from my practice as a rubble builder for this institutional in, uh, learn from this and apply it in my institutional environment and the other way around. And I think it's very much a thing that, again, going back to my grandfather, he um, has a very specific knowledge of how to build with something. He knows and feels and breathes material. And there I come with all of my fancy academic terms and all of my knowledge and all of my degrees and he still thinks that what I do is just nothing connected to his life his works uh, his life's work and he doesn't understand how um where I am going this is such a far horizon for him um but it is I think the this being able to translate um to hear and to translate and to uh, read the value in all of these different layers. And whether that is something very physical of someone really knowing how to meet a certain material stream and how to grasp it with their hands. 
and how to mold it, uh, which can be a very hands-on and physical knowledge, um, or that is an academic uh, perk or an, uh, uh, an approach, everything should be allowed on the table. And I think this is really something um, that allows anyone to be part of such a workshop. Um, and that, that is the, the question you also asked, who do you want to be part of these experiences? And for me, it's definitely someone who has no idea what architecture, what design, what all of these terms that we know so well, what they mean. Um, these people are really interesting because we claim that we are doing it for them. So how do we give access to them to actually make use of the tools that we provide and see our design as a tool? And um, that is something that you notice when someone comes into a workshop like this and they learn how to guide a material that's larger and heavier and um, higher and overpowering to them. You give them the, the tools in hand to have a direct influence on their immediate surroundings. And this way they develop a kind of civic attitude and a sense of agency to influence and change their environment and empower them. And I think that is the biggest gift that I get from that work, that I see people who feel that they have a bigger influence on what surrounds them and how they live their life, where it sometimes feels quite hopeless or limited or all of these things that we feel at times. And in sense of practice, um, well, I do have to say that Mm, starting my studies at the Design Academy in Eindhoven, especially in the social design department, everyone tells you you're going to come out of there and you're not going to earn money. You're not, and no one understands who you are. And before that, I studied graphic design. And even then, it was hard for people to, <laughs> to understand what I do and um, what it is that I do. Um, and there's this beautiful word you mentioned, you are a rubble builder. So it's really... Yeah. <laughs> words that it's more yeah. people what we are doing <laughs> yes so um i believe on the one hand it's inventing and creating your own profession and evolving diverse these these slash 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 professions that we all somehow have and for me um i wasn't really ready to go all in and become that author designer or that one of those Dutch designers that we have so many of. I wasn't really ready for this. And I wanted to work collaboratively more. And I was a big fan of that museum that I work for now. And all of these practices of being in a cultural institution and putting on exhibitions and engaging with these subjects um, connects to my teaching and uh actually learning much more from these students that I'm teaching than I think I can teach them. Um, this exchange teaches me uh, how to understand this next generation and ask them directly, what will you find beautiful and how will you want to live? So is that cave that I'm building, that woman cave, is that a thing that you will you know, be attracted to. And then there are the workshops and then there is the rubble building um, that brings these things together. And I think it is um, learning how to speak the different languages in these different contexts that allows all of these um, expertises and knowledges to enrich each other. And I think this is something... Um, that we all in our individual disciplines will sooner or later have to learn. I think this interaction between each other and the disciplines as the lines blur more and more. Yeah, I think a great conclusion, I would say. Um, thank you so much, all of you. I think um, this was like probably one of the most empowering talks um, and exchange of ideas that I've been part of the TUV. And I, I really, I think it was also extremely um, 
deep and emotional. And I, this is where I would like to start speaking about. Um, it was it's it's rarely to be spoken about feelings, no, uh, in our um, and academic environment, but also in our practicing um, in in our discipline. It's interesting that all of you, all four of you, you spoke about this kind of alienation, idea of reconnection, then to love, and then only then to care. So that for me was like, uh, um, and once you understand that you need to go to this process first to understand that we are alienated either to the material or to the, some sort of critical understanding of the natural environment or critical understanding of the society, we then need to find ways and methods to reconnect and then to somehow nurture the love in order to care. And that, I think it was extremely uh, thoughtful how you all four came into this loop. I was just listening and then somehow trying to understand that. And I think that's also so important for, for, for the students to somehow really inwardly um, declare and, and, and feel that only through that we could build another future for our profession, not only for the profession, but also for the constructing or unconstructing or for the environment at large. Um, that was, I think, extremely brilliant. Um, and I think you all, within this kind of, you know, process of feelings, what it came in all of your talks was that you need to, the disalienation also means that we are physically not connected and that you did an open call or like a strong call for a physical interaction. So like, you know, to really empower and activate the body to start not design or think or research, but actually co-create. I think that was, uh, I think that if, I, I, I think it was many years ago when we started to do this um, a visiting school nanotourism and we started with one-to-one -one projects with the students. And I, for the first time in my life, I saw how differently skilled the students come from different acad academic institutions. And some of them never hold the material in their hands, never hold their tools in their hands. And it was really striking because if you were fortunate enough to have a grandfather like you did or I had, um, and you had to, get, to have a grandmother to be at the soil and, you know, on the field, but actually then to be in the woods and then to hold certain tools, this is somehow obvious for you, but it's not for everyone. And this, what I'm speaking, it's 10 years ago or even more. So, and I, I think this kind of physical interaction, I, if you, I think every one of us should be repeatedly involved in physical interaction. Otherwise, we should not get the license to design. Because only, as also you, Max, explain how you start your workshop with nothing. I think it's so important to start appreciate of what is the material that we, you design with or non-material, whatever it's non-existing. And I think uh, then thinking just allowing yourself to, to design things from this moment on, it's something that could per, like radically change our practice if this would not be this kind of small initiations and in instances, no. And then one short maybe uh, reflection was also, you mentioned, I think also Max, uh, borrowing the tools. Um, we also, for one big installation, we borrowed the material uh, we and we returned it to the so you know to the wood making. Uh, so how to think with borrowing the material, not to harm it in a such a way that could be used for its uh, primer mode. No, I think that that's one of the things that I think it's really really important. What you all addressed are two other issues. So one was physical interaction. Um, the second one was aesthetic. Um, I grew up as a, as a student, as a young architect in the time that aesthetic was not something to talk about. It was like, you know, ethics becomes before the aesthetics, that was one stream and the other stream was like this kind of um, superstar architects, not like just, you know, gibberish in every possible for, uh, field. It was really uh, crazy. And I think there is an opportunity for new aesthetic that comes from this deeper understanding and this deeper love and care 
that we should be basically reintroducing, but that of course it can be very sensual. It could be also very attractive. It, but actually it has a story. It has a narrative. It links to what you, Estelle mentioned, the memory, heritage, you know, this is, it's not only the physical environment, geology um, on our planet, but it's also what we have destroyed or created. These are the, the topics that we need to always somehow um, re relate and, and go back uh, back to it. And I think it's a, really an opportunity for these new aesthetics coming out of this deeper understanding. Um, what I, I think it's also maybe important, which came, the, the third point was, Research, you, you spoke about yourself, about researchers. Um, so it was first you, you research, whoever, you all just research in order to allow yourself to even start thinking of a design, but then it's very much intertwined with the making of it, you know? So it's research, design, make, but this is not linear. Um, so basically these are these acts that they are always coexisting. And this alienation that I meant at the beginning was that for from modernism onwards or also before, the moment that we were not trained as, as craftsmen anymore, but just as thinkers to say to the craftsmen what you do, that that was the moment where this alienation kind of grew apart. And you mentioned, you know, uh, Annie Albers, um, even we are very critical of Bauhaus education, but from certain perspective, they were fast forward to what we want to do today. You know, they were, of course, negating certain things and they uh, but they still worked as as craftsmen for them. Build, dealing with the material was um, allowed you to even design and draw a plan. And we just took the, this opportunity that we can just draw lines and plans and do 3D models without even having the minimum understanding of the, the materials and how to connect them, how to mold them, what is the property, where they come from, what's the abundance of them or deficiency, this kind of things. And even today, what it makes me extremely nervous, and I hope this Lina network is going to address is that we try to prioritize no, uh, certain materials. So now it's like everything should be out of wood, not understanding what type of wood, where, why, how, when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense, you know, and, and understanding still that this is still, you know, uh, pouring of the natural resources with the speed. If everyone builds in wood, we are no, no way we, this is a sustainable a future for our practice and then demonizing the, uh, the the cement, of course, and the concrete to that extent that we don't even use the one that it's already there either in the form of buildings and we don't need to demolish them or the one that it's in the form that you have been dealing with extensively, uh, Charlie, you know, that uh, I, I think that's uh, really opening up a very vast potential not only for experimental practices, but hopefully, you know, to really streams, not only material streams, but the streams of architectural production and also construction industry that would go into this kind of, not a greenwashing agenda, but in, in, a, in a new new world, basically. So to me, I, I, I mean, I really learned enormous amounts. Um, I, I took from your, um, I, I had, enormous amount of ideas, but I think on this was all physical and powerful, but I also think that it was great that uh, Bernadette, you mentioned uh, the idea or the necessity of building vocabularies. I think we need to build the words are important. And I think um, I'm trying to, to, to build this vocabulary that we spoke today about could be one of the libraries. So we need a material library we need the uh, terminology, so the library of words. Of course, we need potential library of spaces and potential library of methodologies in which we could either unlearn or make or kind of re re reconnect to the the matter or or to other people and and to really acknowledge every potential um, participant in in these collective practices. I think and and what they do they bring, you know. Uh, one thing is that you you try to promote inclusion in general, and the other thing is really to to be able to listen to every member 
and to 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 go back as you you know the architect whatever the designer or and to to really allow them to to bring into this collaborative practice the the expertise that we we should be dealing with so yeah um this would be somehow my um let's say response yeah there were two small things um specific yeah i think in the the construction waste i think that's a huge agenda which has been manipulated also by a lot of companies now establishing you know and i think we need to really thoroughly reintroduce it on a larger scale which was really opened up charlie uh, beautifully and also the agricultural uh, waste which you opened up with the you know with the the rice and straw and everything that comes from that i think and of course these two things are necessary not on two worlds they can very easily uh, meet you know the agricultural waste and the construction construction site waste that that i think it's maybe also a thing to to explore with the students or further um and yeah that was uh, what i never realized is with the blobs that you uh, showed it was the first time that i really loved the blob because my you know i was you know i grew up in uh, as a student and young architect and and being a daa in the time that that was really so strong and teaching in graz where they built this horrible building you know all this was and of course also you know building seeing gary what they were doing you know this kind of shapes out of materials that were never made to be shaped like that you know and this is this kind of you know now i understood my feelings towards those very i was really alienated towards those shapes because i didn't under, i love the clouds i love those shapes but not as buildings out of stupid materials that were not meant to be curved you know i like caves so we took the whole group of aa students to the caves which have we have in slovenia to show them what is the most beautiful blobby space they could never create in maya but it has been created you know thousands of years so and i think here with these textile bags i found the reason realized that there is a way to go into this kind of blobby aesthetics but there is a logic and it's a narrative and that's why you can then appreciate and love that shape no um because it it it's by itself because the gravity uh, allows it to happen and that was really beautiful so yeah i i'm overwhelmed um throughout thank you so much you can also respond or be on the other side or, uh, maybe or Thomas, maybe yeah yeah can you hear me better now like this halfway I think now is the moment also to open up. I think for the audience, uh, is there if the vibes are good, the love is there. Please comment or ask. So, are there any questions? No, not even comments. All agreed. Can you come closer to the microphone? Yeah, yeah. Come on, you can even uh, go in front of the camera. Yeah. Actually, just a quick question for Miss Blubbel. Okay, I need to go down. Like, can I sit? I think they don't see me. Do they see me here? No, here. Oh, here. Okay. Uh, actually, I just want to, uh, of course, first of all, since it's now so official, I want to thank you for the enormous input. I found both of the projects very uh, inspiring. Uh, I actually just wanted to. Uh, ask a question regarding the book Ms. Bledel was uh, reading regarding the materials as I tried to note it down but it was too fast for me to the material kinship reader okay got it that's it <laughs> thank you <laughs> I mean like uh, regarding the input that um, uh, Thomas right <laughs> exactly um, asked me to uh, I would actually just uh, as I'm writing as well my master thesis regarding materials and how can we lead actually toward a sustainable uh, uh, affordable architecture as we know that that like building architecture which is sustainable is kind of only for a certain kind of people that addresses it but um, 
can it start like from uh, the materials like the local waste or the local developed materials may that lead towards an affordable sustainable uh, architecture for all of us not only for a few that's like one of the topics that which is now uh, serving as an input for me myself and my uh, question like for my master thesis so I really find it inspiring and I hope to get as well some extra throughout the semester uh, some more input so I thank you all for the great inputs and the good interesting ideas which we got now inspired from thank you <laughs> thank you do you want an answer too yeah <laughs> there was no it question, was sorry, so no hear. need for an answer, it's fine. Yeah, this here is it's better. Fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it was very hard to understand. Is that, that was a question around um, the expense. Of no, sustainable architecture? No, no, that's that <laughs> kind of my question that I was just like kind of, it wasn't more like an affirmation for everything that was already said. It's just like regarding my question, which I'm working on, like that um, it's kind of sustainable architecture because what we're talking now about materials, of course, where architecture starts is like, um, uh, leading toward a sustainable architecture, but architecture which is sustainable, built out of sustainable materials, might be expensive. As um, talk to architects, for example, they might, they said that um, I did a course regarding that. That's why it was like um, that um, that they said like uh, actually building uh, sustainably is expensive and not like normal people don't have really access to it, like living in these buildings, which might be a uh, sustainable build uh, regarding materials or uh, building methods. And that's why like, it was like a question which I am answering like in my master thesis, can like uh, materials be um, leading, like can they be a source of a sustainable but affordable architecture kind of, and as you guys said and presented, there are multiple ways of finding a local or building or transforming materials, which they might lead toward a sustainable architecture. I don't know, I'm about to find out. It's just, that was a question, but not for you. It's my question, <laughs> it was an information, my God. I'm sorry. There will be a diploma on the topic yeah. of her, no? so we will might hear soon in uh, more about that question and possible answers. I think even but to that. Are there other questions? Brave students <laughs> to come forward. No. <laughs> Not anyone. I think you said it all, that's probably, that's more or less, I think, the problem that we heard so many inspiring and, and yeah, thoughts that we should follow up in this semester, but then also continuing with these things, I think, for the future at TU Vienna. And I have to say again, I think, Jakob and I, we told you in private before, we really happy to have you, Estelle and Charlie, as part of this uh, operation and I think you enjoy as well <laughs> so far the hard time will come at the workshop and uh, the problems might occur I'll promise you but um, you know in the kind of a responsive as a resp representative for all the students behind me in the group of your students in the course I we will um, yeah we are looking very much forward to meeting you in all end of the month and then of course in May in Sikhien and please uh, Bernadette and Max, you are also invited, of course, to join in Sekirn. There's uh, two beds left for you both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for all of you and all of you. Thank you. And see you soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Thank see you. you soon. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>